Ecclesiastes is one that is sometimes overlooked. It's one that is seen by many because they focus on, say, a passage, a passage like the first two verses or chapter 3 and verses 1 through 11. And they see these and they say, see, this writer is talking about how useless, no matter how hard we try, how useless the end of our life really is. And I guess if you way want, over want to simplify, and I suppose if you want to look at it with that lens, that's how you could walk away. There are some confusing passages through this book, and I don't want to say there's not. It's a book that we can look at and we can say, okay, is he saying just, just make money and enjoy it because in the end, what's it really matter? But as we'll see, that that is not the focus of Solomon who is seemingly obviously the, the, the one that wrote this book. It is not the, the, uh, the principal concept that he's trying to get across. As a matter of fact, it's somewhat the opposite of what he's trying to get across. Now, just to just do a very simple overview, because we're not going to study the entirety of the book, we're going to study in depth the first three or four chapters and then hit on some high points later on in the book to help us understand where he's, where he's going with all of this. What we see is that the book of Ecclesiastes is actually a Greek word, and so the, the reason that it's used is because the, it's the Greek word that means preacher, and not preacher like uh, someone that is dispensing the gospel, rather someone who calls together an assembly. So it's not as if this man is trying to say, listen, here are some great spiritual truths. He's saying, listen, this is life, folks. This is how things are. And it seems to shine very similarly to a philosophy class in, uh, in a college today. If we miss the key parts. Now, in the Hebrew, this would have been called koheleth, because that's the... Ecclesiastes equivalent. And so anytime that you see the word the preacher throughout this book, he, he calls himself the preacher all the way through. And uh, it's that Hebrew word, and it just simply means one that calls an assembly, someone who calls together an audience, someone who speaks before an audience. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean in a spiritual setting. It can just be in a town hall or something like that. And so when he says the preacher don't see it like uh, I'm a preacher or Luke's a preacher or Eric's a preacher or Philip's a preacher or any of those things. See it like someone that is simply giving an address to an assembly and setting forth ideas. Now, here's a key phrase that is used throughout the book, and that is under the sun. I have seen all under the sun. As a matter of fact, he seems to say, I've tried all under the sun. Now, this means anything and everything that is earthly and carnal, anything that is of this world, whether it be work or love or money or time spent or times and seasons that come and go, I've seen it all. I've seen life. Come and go. To understand this phrase, let's kind of understand it that the opposite would be above the sun or above what is of this world, meaning from God. So when you see the phrase below the sun, kind of see it as a, a marker to say, okay, everything after this is talking in a carnally minded uh, worldview. If we were to only look at this book in a negative mindset, we could walk away thinking the preacher is saying life is worthless, so do what you want. Because in the end, it doesn't matter. There is nothing new under the sun. Why even try? Is how we could look at it. But under the sun is earthbound. And this concept is reused throughout the scriptures. Interestingly enough, this book is not explicitly quoted anywhere in the New Testament. Now, concepts are reiterated. As a matter of fact, we'll look at a few in just a few moments. But concepts are reiterated so much that it seems obvious that there's no way that these 
people that were Jews that had become Christians and were writing couldn't have read this book like Peter and Paul and John and James. Some of their writing is so reflective and mirroring the writings of this preacher, of this speaker, that it's obvious that they're referring to the ideas that are put forth in this book. At 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4 through 6, he says, Paul says, and my speech and my preaching are not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. In verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Here he makes the marked difference between a spiritual mindset and a godly mindset, a carnally mindset and a spiritual mindset. One is from God and one is solely focused on what is of this earth. Paul makes that argument in those first three chapters. What are you focusing on? What are you thinking about? What is your mindset? And that is the entirety of this book. Instead, see this book as life lived by purely earthly or human reasoning and values without faith in God and his values is futile, is worthless. That is the key to this book. That is the full understanding of this book. And, I, and I'm not trying to say that I came up with this and that I'm the only one on the planet that understands this book. But when you only read verses like 1 and 2 of chapter 1 and the first 9 or 10 verses of chapter 3 and only pick and choose those verses that are so commonly quoted in the religious world and around us, sure, we can walk away saying, look, he says it's not worth your time. Rather, Looking at the whole of the, this book, we see him saying, if you only think about worldly things, you have nothing to live for. You have nothing. And so this is quite honestly, I, I suppose you could say, one of the greatest apologetics books in all of the Bible to say, live for God, because if not, what do you have? Humanists have looked at this book, those that say, we live our life, and that's it. Whenever you die, you're like Rover, you're dead all over, and that's it. It's that kind of mindset, but rather, this preacher, Solomon, says, yeah, if you don't have God, you've got nothing. Now, this book seems to be an older man writing to younger people saying, look, I've tried it all. I've done it all. I've experienced it all. I went out and I tried to do all of these things and I've come full circle realizing that out there, it's exciting for a season. But what is lasting is faith in God. We see in verses 12, of this chapter through chapter 2 and verse 3, the recognition for the need and reliance upon God sets in, saying, yeah, you can try all that, but without God, you have no direction. It was written by Solomon, suspected by many to be Solomon's confession or letter of repentance for going astray, but coming back at the end of his life. Perhaps that's a little optimistic. I'm not sure. I'd love that to be the case. That after many years of living luxury and, uh, and hedonism, living a life of finding wife after wife and experience after experience, he finally said, listen, it's not worth it. Now, there's no scriptural record that that's what came to be, but it, it fits a picture, and perhaps that may be the case. But what we see is somewhat, rather than seeing this book as a pessimistic book, we can see it somewhat like a realist view of life. Now, those of us that are realists are actually pessimists that refuse to accept that they're pessimistic. And I suppose that's what he's doing. And he's saying, listen, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've done it all, man. I've tried to experience it. 
and it's not worth it. And he talks about the simple things in life that can bring just as much joy as the most luxurious lifestyle. Now let's jump through here some key verses of this book that help point us toward the idea that he is not just selling hedonism and humanism and all of those mindsets that are so prevalent in our world. That is, live for today, for tomorrow we die. Live for now, because in the end, what's it really matter? You're going to die anyway. Chapter 5 and verse 7 of Ecclesiastes. For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities. But fear thou God. Chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. Seeing there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? You know, if you pause there, if you stop there, he says, look, look at your life. What's it worth? What is it worth? But then he asks these rhetorical questions. For who knoweth what is good for man in this life and all the days of his vain life, which he spendeth as a shadow? For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? I'll tell you who can. God. God knows what's far bigger than this and knows what's bigger than your life and knows and has planned for something more than just what happens during these years that we live. Chapter 7 and verse 29. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions, many ways. They have sought out their own destruction and chains. Now, here it's interesting. First off, it's interesting because he uses this phrase, I have only found this or only this have I found. He says this about 15 times. So it's not the only thing he's found. He's found it a, a bunch of times. But he keeps boiling it down to say, okay, okay, let's just, let's just, Wrap it up in a nice box. Here's what to know. You could try it all. But what matters is God made you upright and you were the one that went out and tried to find sin. Chapter 12 and verse 11. Now again, this book is only 12 chapters long. It's only about 30 minutes to sit down and read. I highly recommend you do that. Chapter 12, and verse 11, the words of the wise are as goads or pricks or prods and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. He says, these are the things, these are the two types of sayings throughout the books. Goads are the words of wisdom, viewing life negatively, which call us to think and evaluate. And nails are as the positive God-centered passages that fix those fixed points of reference and quest for meaning. He says, you can hang your hat on the nails, the pieces of wisdom that carry through. Now, let's just flip back to chapter 1. In verses 1 through 11 of chapter 1, he says, vanity. What is vanity? Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Vanity is a vapor. A breath. It's fleeting. There's nothing left over. It's like when you're standing outside on a cold winter morning and you breathe and you see your breath escape your mouth, but then soon there's nothing left to prove that you've breathed. That idea. It is a vapor. Life is breath. And he is not preaching nihilism. He's not preaching that everything is worthless. Now, again, you turn to this book and you read a lot of different books about this, this book and you can find all kinds of isms and uh, all kinds of uh, uh, humanism and nihilism and hedonism and all of those things. And I'll boil it down to say this. That's not what he's preaching. That's not what he's saying. Psalm 39 
we see the psalmist say, Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and mine age is nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. As repeated time and again through the book of Proverbs, the idea that we come and we go. You read this book. You read that passage and understanding that life is vanity. Vexation of spirit means catching the wind. I don't know if you've ever tried to do that, but it's impossible. As a child, you probably stuck your hand out the window trying to let the wind blow your hand in different directions. I saw a 30-something-year-old do it the other day, and I just thought, life never changes. It's that, trying to grab something that is uncatchable. And you read those phrases, and of course you're reminded of James 4 and verse 14. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. James has obviously read this book and understands, understands what life is, that it comes and it goes. In verses 4 through 7, of chapter 1, and I know we're way oversimplifying and summarizing, but in chapter 1 and verse 4 through 7, we see that life is a pattern of cycles. It comes and it goes. Children are born and people die. The sun rises and sets. The rivers run and go down into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. We hear, and yet our minds are not full of knowledge. Now, this is not talking necessarily about the hydrological cycle. It's talking about the simplicities of life that Things come and go, and it's almost as if there's no proof that it happened. In verse 9, there is nothing new under the sun. We like new things. We like to try new things, eat new things, go new places, be new, and hear new things. We like to wear new things and be new. But what is new? The preacher's point is not that there's nothing to be gained in chasing the wind, but that there's not a need for the chase in the first place. Meaning, you can go and experience all kinds of things, and sure, at the end, you'll have a book full of pictures and experiences and memories, and perhaps gain some wisdom along the way, as he says is his whole point and his whole purpose. And he says, listen, it's not worth chasing the wind in the first place. Our accomplishments, successes, wealth, and so on cannot erase the nagging problem that faces every single one of us, wealthy or poor, advantaged or disadvantaged, lost or saved, the nagging problem of death. Death is re-mentioned time and again through this book to remind us, I don't care who you are, you've got to face death. I don't care how much you try to ignore that problem, you will face death. And because life ends and is vanity, we should live life working for the day in which we die. Live life backwards, so to speak. This chapter in this book is not meant to be depressing, but humbling. Put life into perspective. Chapter 1 and verse 12. Chapter 1 and verse 12 through chapter 2 and verse 3 is, a, is another section. Chapter 1 and verse 12 through th 3, he's tried every joy in life to try and find ha happiness. Here's the thing, though. Happiness is a temporary condition. He tried to find meaning through mirth, pleasure, wine, folly. It could even be argued through women and experiences of love. Just out to have a good time to the de detriment of what is wise and productive. In verses 4 through 8 of chapter 2, he worked and built houses and vineyards and orchards and building projects and gardens and their temporary reward. You could turn to 1 Kings chapter 7 and chapter 9 and 2 Chronicles chapter 8 and read of all of the building projects that Solomon was involved in and you just think, man, number one, that man's got a lot of money and number two, he was constantly building something. 
and not just building a shed in the backyard, he's building gardens that would be held for years and centuries as some of the greatest. And that's not to mention the temple, because that's something else entirely. Just his stuff for himself. He tried that. Guess what? It didn't bring lasting pleasure and, and happiness in verses 9 through 11. In uh, verses 9 through 11, he tried wealth from labor and its temporary reward. Yet in verse 14, in the, same, the same thing happens to the rich and the poor. Death. Verse 22. What do we have at the end of the day? Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 22. For what hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart, wherein he hath labored under the sun? When you leave this world, what do you take with you? Nothing. He revisits that idea time and again. The idea of passing it down to another generation. Are we able to face death and its reality head on? Or are we seeking distraction and diversions from it? You hear about people that are involved in drugs and alcohol, riotous living, and all kinds of things that seem to bring, bring pleasure for a period of time. Why are they doing it? To escape. They want to escape for a little while. Even if it's just an hour or two. What are they trying to escape? The problems of life. The nagging problems of life. They try to lay down at night and their minds can't shut off and so they pick up a bottle to try to ease the pain, to try to face the fa forget the fact that they have to face life and death. In verse 24, read with me, second, or, uh, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 24. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should be, make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. Verse 25, for who can eat or who else can hasten thereunto more than I? For God giveth to a man what is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail and to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vexa vanity and vexation of spirit. Now, in verse 24 he says, Enjoy the simplicities. This is not saying eat and drink for tomorrow we die. He's saying enjoy the simple things that God has given. Not because it's all we have, but because we do have them. From chapter 1 and verse 14 through chapter 2 and verse 23, God is not mentioned a single time. But in verses 24 through 26, he's mentioned three times. Showing where all good things come from. Which, of course, is reiterated time and again through the New Testament. But in verse 26, he talks about this is vanity and vexation of spirit. What is vanity and vexation of spirit? Didn't you just say that it was good and it was from the hand of God for us to have these simple pleasures in life? This striving after the wind is for a sinner to labor and toil, to amass wealth with the, when the disposition of that wealth is in the hands of God, not in us. It's nothing but striving after the wind on the sinner's part. Meaning, when all you care about is getting more and gaining more and having more. And that's all you're about. In the end, you've gained nothing. God and our happiness is a touchy subject in our modern world, especially among young people. <clears throat> because we are told by evangelicals, by the modern religious world, go find your happiness. Go find what makes you happy. Go do what makes you happy. Go be happy. And if you're happy, God's happy with you doing that. God did not command us to go find happiness. Rather, go find him and happiness 
and peace may come. Chapter two is not about go find happiness, go find your happy, go what makes you happy. It's about go find God that has given us life and serve him. Many of those in the religious world and even in Christ's church, I hear it among religious friends and Christians. Do what makes you happy. That's not found in the scriptures, folks. This chapter alone teaches how foolish, unwise, and futile, not alone, how, let alone how ungodly that is. Now, that's not to say that God wants us to be miserable and depressed. But that our main objective in life is not to go find what makes you happy. It is to fear God and obey him. Chapter 12 and verse 34 and 35. Happiness is not a goal to be pursued, but a byproduct of the right relationship with the creator. If we are happy while serving God, fantastic. And I don't say that sarcastically. We should be joyous in the fact that we are saved by the blood of the Lamb and have a hope of something far better than this world. But happiness is fleeting. The joy of the Lord has staying power. Remember that as we read through the rest of this book and study in the last few minutes. In chapter 3, some key verses. Read with me verse 14 and 15 of chapter 3. I know that. Whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put, at, put to it. There is nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that man should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. And God requireth that which is past. Contrary to man's fleeting times and works, to God's enduring works, we, God knows what was and is and will come. How comforting that is, that God is transcendent. God is not bound by the times and seasons of this world. Life is much like building a Lego set. Each piece has its time and its place to fit, and God holds the blueprints. We're bound by times and seasons, but God is not. And I know that this could be a far deeper subject than what I'm giving time to but in verses 1 through 8 I don't want to skip past that to everything there is a season a time for every purpose under the sun a time to be born a time to die a time to plant a time to pluck up that which is planted a time to kill a time to heal a time to break down a time to build up a time to weep and a time to laugh a time to mourn a time to dance a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing a time to get a time to lose a time to keep a time to cast away a time to rend and a time to sow a time to keep silence and time to speak a time to love and a time to hate a time for war and a time for peace Probably the most well-known verses in all of this book. And I hear it quoted rather frequently at random times, quite honestly. But life is not just about those polarized moments of beginning and end. But also those moments in between. Life is a series of seasons Sometimes seasons that happen simultaneously. We may not understand it. It may not make a whole lot of a sense to us. The time, life, comes and goes, and it's not based on us. Not all life is good, but not all life is bad either. Much of it falls in between, just like in these verses. Not everything is birth and death. Not everything is planting and reaping and all of those other things. There's a whole lot of stuff that happens right in between. And so he gives these polarized moments to say, listen, life, are, life, life is full of seasons. And there's a time for a lot of things to happen. But in between that, you can't overlook. It's just like a tombstone, like a headstone that has the beginning date and the end date, that dash stands for a whole lot of life that happened or didn't happen. In verse 9, though, what profit 
Hath he that worketh in what therein he laboreth. The transition verse is much like Hebrews 9 and verse 27. Is it, appointed, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Yes, we'll all face death, but after this comes judgment, a happy day for those who are God's people. A less than happy day, to say the least, for one who is not. He's seen travail. He's seen trying times, which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it, to be tried in it. That's a deep thought in and of itself that we don't have time to jump into. Verse 11, we see that God holds time in view of eternity, which we can't see or understand entirely. God understands in verse 16, he again says that under the sun is injustice. But God, the God of justice, we talked about on Wednesday night. God, the just, understands and can fix all. In verse 19, both man and beast face death in the grave. Verse 20, both man and beast go to the same place, the dust of the earth. But in verse 21, while both man and beast go to the dust of the earth, there's a difference between man and animal. And that is that man is spiritual and must face, deter face eternity. Beasts die and they cease to be. He says, that's your difference. Do something with it. Verse 22 and verse 12 are not preaching that we should just give up everything and live life and enjoy life. Live for the here and now and what is enjoyable. Rather, enjoy what God gives you and do not worry about the things outside your control. Very, very quickly. Chapter 4 hits very heavily on the use of friends. In verse 1 through 3, when people don't know God, who do they turn to for comfort? So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they were no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors were, there was power, but they had no comforter. He then goes on and he says, they had nothing. They have no one. When, they don't, if, when you have no God, when you do not have the almighty God, when bad times come, who do you have to turn to? What do you have to turn to? He says, it'd have been better if you'd not been born than to live life godless. Solomon makes this bold statement that if only oppression, godlessness, and worldliness is known, it's better to have never lived. Verses 4 through 8, what good is work if it's only for your gain and your benefit? He says, share. Help others benefit. What good is it if you've lived your life to the exclusion of your family and your friends and your loved ones and God if all you've done is work for a dollar? What do you have? In verse 8, if we only work for our benefit, again, what is the purpose? Verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to keep him up or help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Naturally, these verses speak of a true, honest friend, loyal friend. Find those who will lift you up, encourage you to do right, and live a godly life. Those with a worldly mindset are often cutthroat and disloyal. And that doesn't mean they're not Christians. Sometimes Christians are like that too. But with a worldly mindset, just because a person attends services and is called a Christian and has obeyed the gospel doesn't mean they're necessarily spiritually minded. verses 13 through 16 foolishness is defined he talks about foolishness better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished foolishness is defined through the scriptures 
as one who will not be corrected or listen to wisdom. It's better to be humble and correctable than even the highest in the land, but hardened and foolish. In verses 14 through 16, I know that I'm, I've gone over a little bit. Just be patient. In verses 14 through 16, I hear a lot of times about popularity. As a matter of fact, a while back I was doing a study with a young family and they said uh, they had some teenagers that were in school and facing teenager life. And I said, can we talk about popularity? And I thought, I mean, the, bio, the word of God doesn't even contain the word popularity. But verses 14 through 16 touch somewhat on the idea. Because it talks about a, pre, uh, a king and how everyone bowed down to this king. But then he died and the people bowed down to him just like the first one. You see, the thing is, yes, some may be lining up to praise you, but they will do the same for the next one that comes along. While a good reputation is a good asset for Christians, popularity is fleeting. Don't get caught up in how many friends you have. Find real, verses 9 through 12, friends. People who will be there to help you when you fall down. Now, fast forward to chapter 12. You want to hear what the basis of this whole book is. Number one, he gets a little more optimistic once you get to chapters 10 through 12. But in chapter 12, he wraps it all up. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole of man, or the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. He says, you want to know why you're living? It's not about that job. It's not about money. It's not about how big or small of family you're in, uh, your family is. It doesn't matter how many hours you've put in. It doesn't matter how much wealth you've amassed. What matters is if you feared God and kept his commandments. Because in the end, it will all of your works, all the things that you've done secretly, in private, in public, no matter what it is, God will bring that into judgment. That's the purpose. He says, living life without God is a waste of life. Now, you may be thinking, I don't, I'm not wasting my life. I believe in God. That's wonderful. I'm glad that you do. Do you do the second part of his admonition in chapter 12? Fear God and keep his commandments. You see, in chapters 14 and 15 of John, Jesus equates love of God, not with proclamations, not with billboards and t-shirts and bumper stickers and posts on Facebook. He equates obedient or love of God with obedience. And you cannot love God or Christ or his church without obedience. Have you obeyed the gospel? You see the plan that we speak of and that we talked about last night in depth. Obedience to the gospel is not a rote, thoughtless plan in which you say, okay, I've done that, I'm good. It is a conscious, deliberate decision to say, I'm going to follow Christ and contribute to his kingdom the rest of my life. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, as we see in John 8 and verse 24. Repent, Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. Confess Christ as the Son of God, Acts chapter 8 and verse 36. And be baptized for the remission of your sins, Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 through 6. Come in obedience to the gospel and then continue in obedience Recognizing that at the end of this life is a judgment. There's more than just these few breaths we take here on this planet. 
than the few heartbeats in which we live. But there's far more than that because there's an eternity in being. If you're one of either class, please come forward as we stand and sing.